Good morning to you, Destin. Good morning, Matt. Are you ready to go on an adventure? Am I ever ready for an adventure? Are you packed? I don't know, really, but I'm just now finishing my second breakfast and I'm loading the ponies. <laughs> well, one can't go on an adventure before second breakfast. Well, today we're going to review The Hobbit which is something I've been looking forward to for ever so long. Counting down days, my friend. What are you, by the way? I'm a hobbit. <laughs> I'm a crotchety older hobbit. <laughs> All right. No, no, we didn't agree on characters. We didn't agree on characters. So today... I just felt like there should be voices. I know. Today is the day where we get to review the hobbits, and we thought it would be fun to start here in the Shire as we go on our quest. <laughs> So, uh, what do you say? Let's do it. It feels so warm and safe and cozy here. Who knows what adventures await us beyond the borders of this friendly place? I listened to the audiobook of The Hobbit because we do this audiobook thing where we recommend books to each other and then we listen to them and then we talk about them later. Did you have yeah. a chance to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So I've I've listened to The Hobbit one and a half times. So uh, I listened to the Rob Inglis version. Which version did you listen to? I listened to the Andy Serkis version. He's the guy who voiced and acted Gollum in the movies. And really? he was Ulysses Claw, the arms dealer from like Wakanda or outside of Wakanda in the Marvel Universe. Mm. Wasn't he also in the Drug He's Stopper? I wish he was in the drug stopper. No, you're thinking of Nikolai Volkov. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Got it. <laughs> okay. He's running drugs again. Bad drugs. The kind of drugs that need to be stopped, but that can only be stopped by the drug stopper. Got I it. I wrote that line. Did you really? I'm really good about it. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> so you're basically Tolkien <laughs> in your storytelling. It's the same though. exact idea. Rich, <laughs> dynamic characters in an immersive world with serious thematic emphasis. Yeah, same yeah, guy. A, a clear sense basically. of purpose. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me ask you this. Have you watched the Hobbit movies that Peter Jackson did? All right, I'm going to level with you. So I read The Hobbit for the first time in sixth grade and okay. uh, wonderful. Uh, I remember thinking about, you know, when they were shooting the arrow, it's smog, smog, however you want to say it. The, the concept yeah. of having armor on the outside of a magical beast, almost in my mind, but there being a weak spot and you had to exploit that weak spot. Something about that specifically stuck in my mind. And so that, that was magical. Fast forward 10, 15 years, probably 20 years, we were at a lake house retreat thing with a buddy of mine, and we decided to watch The Hobbit one evening. And we started watching it, and I was just like, this sucks. I fell asleep. I was like, I, I'm just not interested in this at all. So I went back last year, and I, I listened to The Hobbit. No, it was earlier this year on our trip out to CU. I listened to The Hobbit just for fun, and I loved it. It was great. I could care less about the movies. Um, or I could not care less about the movies. I I, I don't. I know I don't, what you meant. I I don't, I don't really have know how a, that saying is supposed to go, but I get what you mean. Yeah. So whatever. I think the book is what I'm here to talk about. Like if you want to talk about the movie, we can do that. But man, the the book is of course where it's not. At. It's not a movie club. It's a book club. Yeah. No, exactly. I, I, but the reason I bring it up is because I'm guessing that a bunch of people in the third chair have not read the book, but have seen the very drawn out series of movies that do not live up to the quality of the Lord of the Rings trilogy at all. I mean, one of those Lord of the Rings trilogy movies, Return of the King, won Best Picture. They were good. The Hobbit films just didn't work on a lot of levels. We don't need to do a post-mortem on that. But the reason I brought up the movies is to say, we're talking about the book, not the movies. The movies are weird. They're caught between two eras of time and thought they don't know what they are. They don't know what they're trying to be. They chewed through at least two directors. But Tolkien had an entirely different process when he wrote The Hobbit. Have you read anything about that? Do you know anything about where The Hobbit came from? No, but I'm back. Well, I know that Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Hobbit, I knew that he hung out with C.S. Lewis and they yeah. used to they used to drink together at this pub called The Eagle and Child. 
Yeah. Or as, or as they called it, the, the bird and the baby. I've been there. Dad and I Likewise. had- Likewise. We had fish and chips there. You've been there? I have, yeah. I took Aaron Utech. We went and hung out. That's awesome. Yeah. So so I went there. I had to make the pilgrimage there in Oxfordshire. And uh, Dad and I, we went over to the Kilns, which was the home of C.S. Lewis. And then I got to see his grave. I did a grave rubbing. You know what that is? I do. It's where you just lean down and you put your face on the grave and then you just kind of move your hips back and forth so your face rubs on it. No, that's not a grave rubbing. A grave yeah, rubbing is where you take a, uh, a piece of paper from a local art shop and you try in your broken Alabama English to explain to the dignified man at the art shop, I need to like scrape a crayon on the <laughs> on the paper so that the letters from the, the tombstone come off. Oh, you, you want to take a rubbing, do you? Okay, so this is <laughs> what you'll need. when they say it. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so anyway, they, they hooked me up with paper and all this stuff, and I, I took a couple of grave rubbings. Really cool. I gave those to some people, and I have one here at the house. But anyway, I love it. I, I love the whole concept of these two people being friends. My understanding is that J.R.R. Tolkien was a philologist. Is that correct? What's a philologist? I thought a philologist was a person that studied the origin of words. Am I wrong about this? No, I think you're on to something. Yeah, I think that's the right term. I was just pestering you. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm right. Okay. It's such a, so it's such a ginormous word. Yeah. Yeah, he was a philologist, and so he studied words, and he was really into literature. But that's about all I know. Like, How, how did the, the stories come to be? Well, my understanding is that these are the stories that he made up for his kids. And Really? Yeah, that he just told this, I guess it would have been between maybe the late 1920s and mid-1930s to his kids. Like my story about uh, the friendly dragon. I mean, that's what we did. We just wrote stories. They weren't this good, but oh no, I made up stories for my kids and I put pen to paper on a bunch of this stuff and I made it up as the kids were going through those childhood wonder years where all stories are new and fresh. I don't think I imagined myself to be a C.S. Lewis or a J.R.R. Tolkien because I sure ain't. But it was really fun. And unlike any other writing I've ever done, making up those stories during the day, knowing that I had a deadline of bedtime each night during those years, it really pushed me to be creative and to think and to show up with something. And then each night I did. It just wasn't good enough to turn it into a book like The Hobbit, but The Hobbit was good enough. And so you and I get to read the Tolkien family bedtime story. Oh, that's really cool. I made up stories about a little girl named Pink Sausage Mildred, and her job was, well, the the thing she created as her job was she would take her kayak, because she lived down by the river, <laughs> not in a van, but she lived down by the <laughs> I river. I wondered if you'd go there. Okay. No. <laughs> down by the river, and, and she, people would drive across the river, and they'd throw trash out of the car, and she always took her that kayak means. down there, and she would clean up the river. That was her thing. And so she had a little basket, and she had a little pig named Pork Chop. Pork Chop could swim; he was really funny. And her her brother named Blue would always get you know get involved. Yeah, it sounds like your stories were way better because you had upside down jellyfish stars. That sounds pretty good. We did have upside down jellyfish stars. We did have that. My kids got to hear one chapter of Pork ch- Sausage, Pink Sausage, Mildred. Oh yeah, and Pork Chop at that thing that we all went to together in Park City. You didn't have your family. I had mine. And we hung out for uh, a couple of days and nights. And it was story time. And you were like, I have one. And I was like, yeah, let's take a break from my thing. And so you sat my kids down when they were really little. And you told them a Mildred and pork chop story. Yeah, I forgot about that. That was the first time you'd ever met them. First day you'd ever met my kids. Oh, I told them about pink sausage Mildred. That's fun. You did. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it was lovely. Well, that's cool. Well, sweet. Yeah. So, The Hobbit. (laughs) Well, let me ask you this. Does that make the story better for you, knowing that this was for his kids and that that's who he constructed it for? Or would it be better if you felt like this story was constructed for you? Is is that a fact? Like, is it it an, an accepted fact that this was written for his children? That is an accepted fact. Really? Okay. Yeah. I've never read that anywhere. Um, I don't know. That is true. If you'd like me to substantiate it for you so that we can move forward, I can do that. I I mean, I, I, I take your word for it. That's your fact, not mine. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it changes it for me at all. Um, It's just so well done. 
it has a story arc. You know, there's an objective that we're trying to do the entire time that's pushing us forward through the story. But the, there's all these side things that are getting in the way the whole time. The characters are amazing. Like the mental image I have of goblins, of trolls, you know, the way he draws these characters. And what I thought was really interesting, are, are we just jumping into it? What are we doing here? Absolutely. Yeah. Rock and roll. The thing I like about the way he starts the book, you got Bilbo at the house, Gandalf shows up. You know, he tells you this is a hobbit, and he describes the attributes of of hobbits and all these things, but he puts you in Bilbo's head. And the way he does that is he tells you how awkward things are. Like, oh, you know, he shows up and like he's gotta he's gotta provide food for all these people that are coming in. And he makes you empathize with Bilbo and you but you also understand a little bit about Bilbo. Like he's he wants everything in order. And so this is really frazzling him that he has to get all these plates out and feed all these people. And he didn't invite them, and they're just barging in. The way Tolkien puts you into the mind of Bilbo early on, with what I thought originally was the boring part, you know, like a, a little party that you're not expecting, yeah. it serves a lot of purposes that you don't really see at first. And it, it helps you empathize with who Bilbo is, and it helps you understand what exactly he's all about. And that shows you that all of these other adventures are going to be so out of character because he's worried about what time we're going to do breakfast. I didn't like the the scene at first until I went through it the second time and I understood what the purpose of it was. That's the way I took it. What did you take about, the, you know, from the first scene? What, what, what did that do for you? Yeah, same reaction for me. I found it a little drab the first time that I, I read The Hobbit. I did not ring, read The Lord of the Rings before watching The Lord of the Rings. I just flirted with those books, but never got through them. The Hobbit we went through when I was a kid. Didn't remember it very well. Remember thinking it moved a little slow for my taste. And then re-encountering it in print and now in audiobook as an adult, I agree. I think that opening sequence is really important. As a kid, I was like, "Why? Well, I don't even want to know about somebody who likes order and likes his house to be together I can't relate to that. Get to the adventure. Now I encounter it again. I'm like, I get that. I, I have a way some things work. I find meaning in that. It keeps me sane. And wow, fish and company after three days is the rule. But how much more does that company stink when it's 13 people who show up unannounced and need to be catered to? And they're just bulls in a china shop. They're wrecking all your stuff. Like this feels screwed up. And I have a lot of things to do. I have stuff on the calendar. I can't go on a gigantic adventure right now. I mean, I just felt such a different batch of emotions and so much more empathy for Bilbo this time around. But the other thing that I caught that I don't know why it just never stood out to me was all of the business about the Bagginses and the Tooks. Oh, yeah. And how Tolkien intones that there is a genetic predisposition within him that is very real and that he is a split personality that half of him secretly wants all of this adventure and half of him really likes the ease and dignity of not adventure. I love the way and, he called it tookishness. Yes. I thought that was just the cleverest way to say it. The cleverest? That's a word, right? <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, and then in Lord of the Rings, when you've got you know, Pippin and Merry, and at the one point, you know, uh, Gandalf drops out, you're a fool of a took because he's, like, like the Took thing means something. It wasn't just like, that's your name. In that community, the, that has certain connotations. Great job. How Tookish of you. So I like that the Bilbo was like us, um, torn on the question of adventure, torn on the question of risk, torn on the adventure of whether, or the issue of whether it should be you or I who goes to resolve a problem or combat an evil or whether it should be someone else, but we'd really like someone to please do it. I liked that. And I also liked the way that introduced this theme throughout of race. And it's a completely different era of the conversation the of what? about race. 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 Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. That some things in Middle Earth, please don't read between the lines of this at all in terms of some social commentary on real Earth. But there, Tolkien, the all-seeing narrator is more than comfortable with saying, yes, this tendency exists for this family, and that is somewhat genetic. 
And then he just goes to make sweeping racial generalizations about the you know the woodland elves and about the Rivendell elves and about dwarves. Dwarves are like this. They're like this. And even the best of them still have this tendency. Did that chafe you at all? Did that feel like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't say that about dwarves. Easy. Not all dwarves. Or did that just roll as being yeah, just part of the story? I mean, like the goblins are the way the goblins are, man. Everybody knows the way the goblins are. How are the goblins? Yeah, I mean, they're just evil things. They they make a lot of things, clever things, but nothing of beauty. Ah, yes. Well <laughs> said. Yeah. I mean, yes. that line, I remember reading that line. I was like, man, that's beautiful. <laughs> I knew you'd bring it up. I knew you'd bring up that line. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought of you when I heard that. Not because I think you're a goblin, but because I knew that line would stand out to you. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, and there's just so many one-liners that I just I just connected with. I, I like the I like the fact that he says Gandalf is he couldn't do everything, but he could do most things, and he could really be valuable to his friends in a pinch or in a tight corner or whatever it is he said in a tight spot. I love that. Well, it's interesting because it, and who would you say is the ideal in the narrator's mind as a people group in Middle Earth? The elves, yeah, in, in my mind. Okay, let's just go through the races. Can we do that? Okay, yeah, please, yeah. All right, so we've got, oh, it'd be way easier if I could pull up a, there's got to be a list of this, uh, races in The Hobbit. Um, okay, so we've got elves, hobbits, dwarves, orcs, but there's also the goblins and the trolls, right? And two brands of elves. The woodland elves. So, yeah, we get we get the... Uh, what did they say about those types of elves? They are less wise hmm. than Elrond and Galadriel's version of elves. There's so many. So they're not they're not all the same. Okay, so you've got other stuff here. So, all right, Middle Earth peoples. That's what I'm reading here. It's a Wikipedia okay. page. We've got the the Aenir. That's the wizard and the Balrogs. Yeah, these are uh, ancient creatures that come from a, a distant land and still wield some kind of magic or enchantment. They're like almost angels and demons. Yeah, I don't know. They're awesome. And then you've got the free peoples. That's the dwarves, the elves, the men, the ents, and the hobbits. And then you've got the enslaved people, which are two different types of men. The orcs, the trolls, and the barrow whites, which I don't know about that. Uh, and then the other beings, and it's talking about these, the ones that I think we see in the book, we see the river spirits, the giants, the dragons. And yeah. yeah. It's interesting. So my favorite character by far, who do you think my favorite character is? <laughs> uh, let's go with Gandalf. Yeah, absolutely. Gandalf. Duh. Hello. Gandalf okay. is Obi-Wan. Gandalf is the guy. Who's oh, your favorite? Okay. I would have said Gandalf in the past. Now I would say Bilbo. Really? Yeah. You're going to go with Bilbo, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, why Why did you come up with your answer? Gandalf? Because he can shoot fire at stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he he's the wise character. And he's kind of above the things, you know? Every once in a while, he's talking about stuff like, yeah, I've, I probably deserve some of the, the dragon's gold when you get it already. I've done enough for that. He, he says things like that. And so he's very much in the in the market, and he's doing things for motives that aren't altruistic. But at the same time, he's helping his friends. He's got friends from past lives he've, he's lived and past adventures. You know, he, He's going to go talk to Bjorn. Even though Bjorn doesn't recognize him, he knows all about him. He just knows things. And it's a deep wisdom kind of knowing of things. I love it. I think it's awesome. And uh, hmm. yeah, that's why I'm attracted to Gandalf. Gandalf? Yeah. Yeah. I guess you got to say the L, don't you? So Gandalf? Yeah. I, I don't know. Well, you're going to get in trouble either way with the internet. Yeah, you are. You are. Yeah. Somebody's going to post a, a gif about that on your Twitter feed. Yeah, that's fine. I, I'm cool with people. Or a gif. GIFs. <laughs> this episode of No Dumb Questions is sponsored by Audible. We love Audible, which is why we do this audiobook experience thing. 
we like to engage with literature of all types, and this episode itself is our way of doing that. If it has ever occurred to you that like, oh, maybe I'll just tap through the ad, you got to know that you're missing stuff because especially on this one right here, we listened to two different versions of this audiobook. We heard two different performances and I've kind of wanted to wait until we were talking about Audible, the sponsor, before we got into comparing and contrasting those things. Are you cool with going there? Absolutely. Which narrator you listened to? What was the name again? Andy Serkis did mine, and yours was uh, Rob, Rob Inglis. Yeah, Inglis. I've heard great things about his performance. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. What's he do for the songs? He sang them. And he sang them all with his gruff Andy Serkis <laughs> voice. <laughs> and it's dude, it's not perfect. I like that there are some tonal problems. A little bit pitchy, a little bit pitchy, but it feels like the kind of thing where a bunch of people would get their beer steins out and sing and reminisce and who cares if we're perfect vocalists. He does the voice of Rock the Raven. It's so raspy. <laughs> and, and you can tell who all the different characters are because he's got this, this incredible repertoire of voices and voice talent, and it's all one dude. If you didn't listen to the Andy Circus version, it's worth using a credit just to hear the artistry and perfection of his performance. Rob Inglis did a really, really good job, I thought. And, and the the music is what I don't understand. I just don't understand how they did this. Like, did they did write... Did he sing it? Yeah. Did they write actual music or did he make it up? I, I don't know how it went down, but it's incredible. It's really, really well done. Have you ever done this? Like, you listen to a book and you're like, man, that narrator is so good. I'm going to go listen to another thing narrated by this person. Have you ever done that? No, I haven't tracked it that way, but I have definitely made my decision on The Hobbit based on my awareness of how talented Andy Serkis is. That's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I've i done that. So I've you know tracked a book. I'm like, man, that narration was fantastic. And then I'll just go find another one. I met up with uh, a narrator of one of the books, Seven Eves. Oh, yeah. You've talked about that book for a long time. It made an impression. Yeah, I, I went up and met with Mary Robinette Kowal up in Nashville. And, you know, she told me a little bit about the whole process of narrating an audiobook. I would love to explore that sometime with Audible on Smarter Every Day. I've asked him if I could do that. And so I hope to be able to do that one day. I'd love to do an audiobook someday, man. And I've long thought, oh, I got the chops for that. But then I listened to The Hobbit, the way it was performed. I'm like, I don't know if I'm brave enough to just go full on into these voices and just do it. You have to own it. The boldness of the performance, you got to own it. And he owns it. And it's it's just breathtaking how excellent the delivery is. I have a newfound massive respect for the people who do this. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, and what people are going to find is that this Audible thing, I don't know when everybody last looked at it, but if it's been a while, it's not what you remember. It used to be awesome because it had the gigantic collection of audiobooks. Now it's awesomer because there's just massive amounts of spoken content from all kinds of different genres. They've got this plus catalog with stuff that you don't have to use a credit on. That's just there for you whenever you want it. There's, there's a lot more here to go and look at, and it's always growing and always improving. So it's not just like a monthly credit club. It's like access to this whole gigantic thing. Our small group at church, we're actually going through an audiobook together and we're playing like Which one's that? Uh the screw tape letters. It's actually a part oh. of the uh, the plus catalog. Uh Tolkien's buddy wrote that one. Yeah, Lewis. So um here's the offer if you're interested in supporting the podcast by supporting the sponsor, you can do that by going to audible.com slash NDQ or texting NDQ, as in no dumb questions, to 500-500 on your phone. Just like literally put 500-500 in the phone number spot and then type NDQ. A little link will pop up on your phone. You can get a 30-day trial, a free book, and access to the library. The The screw tape letters that's in the Plus catalog, you just like get that for free. So oh. the Plus catalog yeah. is huge. You can get all kinds of, I mean, I just like to scroll through there and see what's up. But when I go run, walk, whatever, when I'm driving, I'm consuming audiobooks. Unless I'm talking on the phone to you. Well, there's that too. Or we're talking on the phone about audiobooks that we're consuming. It's worth the membership just for the Plus catalog, let alone the monthly credit that lets you get pretty much anything. It's a massive library. Dude, 1984 is in the Plus catalog? I didn't realize that. 
What? You burn a credit on that? No, I did not. I forgot that. I just got it. Yeah, 1984, George Orwell. So I listened to that. That was awesome. I'm just going to the top. It's like, what in all categories, the top listens in the Plus Catalog. The first one's Oracle. Don't know what that one's about. The second one's 1984. Man, there's a lot here. It's great. You're going to enjoy it. Go to audible.com slash NDQ. Text NDQ to 500-500. Enjoy The Hobbit. Enjoy all the rest of the books. It's a huge deal, and it supports the podcast. Yeah, and I would throw this out, man. If you enjoyed The Hobbit and you want to stay in that world a little bit longer, maybe you feel like you've done the Lord of the Rings Middle Earth thing because you've seen the movies because of the Lord of the Rings movies are really fantastic, but you haven't. It's so much more immersive so much more in depth and the audible audiobook versions of the lord of the rings are fantastic do yourself a favor work your way through those or go and grab the silmarillion which is the prehistory of middle earth you'll enjoy every last bit of it anyway if you want to support the podcast here support no dim questions we would greatly appreciate that audible.com slash ndq or text ndq to 500 500 that gets you a 30-day trial a free book and access to the library Awesome. You want to go talk about The Hobbit some more? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so where do we go from here? Do we talk about the... Uh, where we go from here is I tell you why I resonate with Bilbo. Do it. Why? The reason I resonate with him this time around, more than I did last time around, is he's modest in his abilities, but he has a usefulness that he doesn't know is there and that he discovers as he goes along, and he is corruptible. He is no Mary Sue. He has problems, and chief among them are the limits he has put on himself and his own mind and his own character. He's more resistant to the corrupting power of the ring than other people who encounter it in Middle Earth, but it still messes with him. He doesn't entirely dislike power. He somewhat is attracted to that. And watching that ring get through the armor for him just a little bit was very intriguing for me. Yeah, yeah. And watching him try to be judicious in that. And then all of that adds up. The I mean, the, the violence, the the running scared, the adventures, the problem solving, the, our, the, the friendship with the dwarves or sort of friendship, the affair with the trolls, the, the relationship with Gandalf, which is very granddad, grandson-ish, all of that adds up to a moment where he uses his burgling skills to try to ad- avoid a horrible, catastrophic, violent evil that everyone was, you know, everybody had brewing. Like He was the guy who tried to step outside of the obvious decision-making, not just to say, come on, guys, let's not have a battle of the five armies, but he tried to do something with the Arkenstone. Through equitability and negotiation with that Arkenstone that would cost him dearly. It would cost him friendships, but it was right. And to me, that's the moment that defines the whole book. That's the completion of the arc that I was tracking with Bilbo on. And I related to him because I, I read the book before and I knew what was coming. And I would hope that I would have the character to do that, even with a ring of evil in my pocket that I find attractive, even with character flaws that I have and character flaws I don't even know I have yet and weaknesses and frailties that I know I have, I hope that even with all of that brokenness and weakness in my life, that I would have the courage and the creativity to do the right thing in such a circumstance. Hmm. That's interesting. But Gandalf does shoot fire. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't think of that as being as big of a deal, as, but now that you now that you say it, it, it does make a lot of sense. That does kind of complete his character arc, doesn't it? Huh. The the moment that I first saw the chink in, in Bilbo's armor is when he stuck his hand into the pocket of the what was it? Was it the troll where he was stealing things? He he stuck his hand into the pocket and he start he and he says he, he was warming up to his new um occupation. Or something like that. I forget hmm. how how he said it, but it's like, oh, okay, there is a glimmer of evil in there. There's a glimmer of selfishness. I mean, he's quite selfish the entire book. However, there's this moment where he's like, oh, I'm good at this. I could take advantage of this. I thought that was interesting. 
Yeah, me too. Dude, we're 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 all over the place. We've got a we've got to get some structure to this. Whatever, I mean, this is structure. We read a book. It's wide and it's sweeping, and we went through it. I mean, if you want to go in order, just kind of a, a chapter breakdown, we can do some of that. Hmm. Well, how do we do this? So they w- they they went on the adventure. They started off. Bilbo's late, um, late to the original meeting. He shows up. They start heading out. I I really like the fact that they're having to walk. And they're and they're using <laughs> ponies. When I was on the Appalachian Trail last weekend, it was all about your water. And you're like, man, okay, how far until the next water so I can filter some more water so I can go some. You know, it's about your food and your water. And if you didn't have those things, you're done. Mm-hmm. It was fun for me reading the book because I had to think about those things. And so when we would pass a little creek or a stream, I would I'd be like, oh, well, I wonder if back in the medieval times, if uh, an army was on the move or you know, a, a a party was going along. If they'd come to a little stream like this, would they all stop and water the horses? What would they do? Would they fill their skins with, with water? And so there's an element of that that I really enjoy, thinking about the logistics of what they're doing. So when they leave um, the Shire initially and they head out into the world, not really knowing where they're going to go, just that in itself, that adventure part of it, I got excited. It's like, whoa, here we go. Did you feel anything or it's just like, what's next? Yeah, absolutely. And you got to build for the long haul. That's what's interesting about it. We've been watching this History Channel show called Alone where they just take some people out and they just put them in the wilderness. And they're like, all right, figure it out. And you can tell right off the bat the people who are going to tap out really early because they don't make any decisions that indicate any kind of long-term plan. They're there to be on the show, to be tourists. Easy for me to say. I mean, I couldn't do it. I'm sure I'd fail at that horribly. But they're not even making moves that indicate they have any intention of staying. Then you watch people who end up performing really well, and they have a plan. And they are moving things around and making moves day one that are going to pay off in day 80 or day 100. What I thought was interesting about the opening here was it looked like Bilbo just had no sense of where this thing would go. Whereas eh, Gandalf... And the dwarves, they were behaving in subtle ways that more looked like they understood the size and the scale and the scope of this undertaking. And as much as it's fashionable to complain about the eagles in Tolkien's writing and to complain about all that walking in Tolkien's writing, all that walking really does give you a sense of how long this took. They don't skip much. You feel the distance in the book. And if Bilbo's your point of view character, feeling that distance more than the other characters feel it is really important to experiencing what you're supposed to experience. It is a hard journey. It is a long journey. And neither you nor Bilbo really has a sense of how vast the undertaking is. So, yeah, I I guess all of that to say, I did feel that. Please forgive me. You said it was fashionable to complain about the eagles. I'm not in the know. I'm not like in the Tolkien whatever community. So why is it fashionable to complain about the eagles? The books do it better. Even in the books, I think if Tolkien were writing today with all that we've learned from the mistakes and plot holes of other people's work, I think he might handle the eagles a little bit differently. But it's just a an easy bailout, an easy solution. And especially in the movies where you don't get really much of anything established with the eagles, At some point you look at it and you're like, why didn't you lead with that? You can just call the eagles like you can whisper in a butterfly and they just come. Well, then why wouldn't you get another butterfly or a whole bunch of them and like whisper into it and be like, hey, we need you to carry these people to the volcano and then we're going to drop this thing in there. (laughs) They better explain like the ring would corrupt them or... The eagles are actually enemies and they're they're not they're suspicious of you. It just that wasn't clear enough in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and it really wasn't clear enough in the Battle of the Five Armies, the Hobbit movie. Oh, like the Eagles are here. Whatever. And boy, Bilbo yells, the Eagles, the Eagles, so many times in the book. Even that felt a little overkillish. So Tolkien takes some abuse for how conveniently the Eagles seem to solve all problems. And Tolkien takes a lot of abuse in ways that I think are kind of funny, if not entirely fair, 
about how much walking there is in his books. They walk and then they walk some more and then we're going to show some more walking. I like that element, but not everybody does. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's closer to reality. Like the Civil War, for example, we think about the battles, but just imagine how much troop movement there was. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, the same with World War II, the same with all these big things. Uh, Lewis and Clark, any quest, um, just imagine how much transportation and stuff like that. It's like in the the never-ending story. They're like, the turtle shows up, and it's like, Bastion, what's the deal? And he's like, oh, it's 5,000 miles away or whatever. And then all of a sudden, a luck dragon comes up. And then, boom, you're there. (laughs) Oh, that was convenient. That's cool. I I took a nap. I woke up. I was where I needed to be. So, yeah, I I can see that now. I mean, now that you mention it, but I didn't think about it at the time. I was like, man, it's pretty convenient because the trees they were in were on fire. So, you know, it's really good that the the eagles got him away from the goblins when the goblins are trying to burn him down. That's nice. And Tolkien was writing on the back end of the Romantic era in literature. The Count of Monte Cristo, Les Miserables, uh, The Man in the Iron Mask, these gigantic, sweeping 19th century stories that were written oftentimes in serial form, each little bit being put into a magazine, a periodical of some sort. I think that's how the Count of Monte Cristo happened. It's a huge book that takes so so much metaphorical walking in the Count of Monte Cristo, but it works because it's kind of a bedtime story for adults that gets published in a weekly newspaper or something. Well, that's the stuff that Tolkien read growing up. That was the pacing that he was used to, and there were some logistical reasons, the medium is the message, that that kind of pacing would have happened in the literature at the time that influenced him at the time that he was a kid. And so some of that comes through. And I think The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings would be worse if they were written now because, one, I think they just go way too hard to the hole in trying to signal to people, like, I understand how things ought to be politically and socially. Here are a few just (laughs) remarks to make sure you know. I think all of the fashionable thoughts now that'll definitely be fashionable forever it just doesn't come up in these books. And that's part of the beauty of them. It really does feel like you get a break from that. But I also think there would have been a tyranny of the urgency bearing down on Tolkien editors coming at him being like, we got to get through this forest way faster. It's just too much time with the spiders and the elves having parties. And they, 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 the people don't like it. They get bogged down. They get bored. Let's make that go faster. And I, I think you would have lost the pacing and the feel of the book that makes you feel like you're on a journey and instead, it would have made you feel like you're going through a video game level. Huh. Dude, you just said so much, and you were so all over the place. You said, there, there was some politi- well, all over the place. Like, two things. There was some One, political it, stuff in there. I, it doesn't virtue signal heavily. And two, the pacing would have been rushed if it were written for a modern audience, and I like that it wasn't. It's only two things. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I can get down with that. I like the swords and the weapons. Did you like the swords and the weapons? I like that they were named. We've talked about those swords and weapons before on this podcast when we Mm. tried to brainstorm a list of things that had names. Which name did you like best? I liked Biter and Beater. I like those names. That's what the goblins called them, right? Yeah, so that's Glamdring, which is Gandalf's sword. And what was the elven name of Thorin's sword? I don't remember it. I don't know. Looking it up. Nuts. Orchrist? And Glamdring. Orchrist. That makes sense. Yeah. That's pretty rad. I like that too. Did you ever get a sense of why those swords were so awesome? They, like, it seems like they didn't do anything magic. They just like were sharp and pokey like normal swords. No, I, I don't know why they were important other than the fact that they were cool. I like that they had the old runes on them and they didn't know what they were. And so there's this gradual revelation of what the sword was when they're hanging out in Rivendale. That's where they learned about that, right? Yeah, because it it helped connect them to the the mystery of when they could get into the Lonely Mountain or something like that, right? Yeah. The runes helped to set them on that plot trajectory. The thing that I I found most interesting was Thorin. Um, The way Thorin, he started for a very... A very altruistic reason. What's a better word than altruistic? I said that twice. It's an honorable, honorable, honorable. Reason. I like that. 
Good. Yeah. And he's like, I'm going to go reclaim what is rightfully my family's. That's where he starts. And then at some point, he gets, you know, the dragon disease, and greed takes over, and the lust for power. You know, once he's finally established, things change. And I like that Tolkien mm-hmm. doesn't dwell on that very much. He's like, yeah, of course he becomes corrupt as soon as he gets power. Duh. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. he just kind of says it. Mm-hmm. I really like that. And of course, at the end, when Bilbo and, and Thorin come back and they reconcile, obviously that's cool. But I find that to be interesting. Like, if you think about Thorin, he is the purpose of the quest, right? Am I reading that wrong? Yeah. No, I think you're reading it right. Sure. He's the whole purpose of the quest. And so they're showing up and they're like, oh, he's, this is this is a very special dwarf and he's important and all this kind of stuff. We got to go on this quest to get back what's rightfully ours and we're going to blah, blah, blah. And then they do it and then they immediately try to to keep all the treasure for themselves. And the the men want their part of the, you know, hey, our... Our whole village just got destroyed by a dragon. You know, some of that's rightfully that's ours. Right. And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, it's ours. I thought that was very, very well done. The fact that as soon as the smoke had cleared, everybody started squabbling. It sounds very much like World War II to me. You know, as, as soon as the smoke clears, like, okay, yeah, we fought with you, Soviet Union, but we all knew you were the enemy all along. And so let's start this hmm. thing called the Cold War. And so I thought that was clever, the way that was That's written. That's very predictive then. I mean, that's the storm clouds were only just barely gathering on the horizon when Tolkien was developing this story in this world. Yeah, you're right. It, it makes sense. I did this thing with students all the time when we talked about the exploration of the new world, We talked about resources. We talked about why it's hard to go somewhere and find valuable things. We talked about why on the Crusades, it was highly unlikely that the Crusaders went to Jerusalem and just found the lance that pierced Jesus' side just laying there. It's just not going to still be laying there. They think about things you lose in your house from a few weeks ago. You don't find a thousand plus years. But further, if it has value, it's going to go away. It's the the old iPad illustration that I used in class. If you take a brand new iPad and you go out and you put it on the sidewalk, I don't know why it's going to be gone tomorrow when you go back for it, but it will be gone tomorrow. Maybe somebody wanted to protect it and try to find the rightful owner. Maybe somebody just saw value. Who knows? Maybe a kid saw it and it was just shiny and interesting. But if a thing has value and it is sitting there apparently available people are going to try to be the first one to get to take it. And so you've got this literal mountain of gold with unending resources that will change the fortunes forever of whoever manages to lay claim to these after the dragon is gone. And of course, five armies show up. It probably should have been more than five armies. Everybody would be showing up to say, we want that. And the claim on it is still relatively loose. We want the thing. Thorin understands other people's nature, and so he's immediately defensive. Whereas before he was open cautiously to coalition building, now he just has absolutely no interest in that whatsoever. You no longer serve a purpose for me, and he's mean and he's defiant, and it's disappointing. Did you feel a tinge of sadness that one of the heroes of the book behaved so badly? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I never trusted Thorin to begin with. (laughs) <laughs> just, really? Yeah, just the way he showed up. I mean, it's great. He could play the harp or whatever it was he played. And, you know, he, he was great at all that kind of stuff. But I, I never did trust him from the beginning. I kind of got that we needed him for the story. But, um, yeah, he showed up without <laughs> without prior reservations to, to Bilbo's house. Like, clearly, clearly he's something altogether different. Even though Gandalf kind of set it all in motion by saying, hey, this is our quest. By the way, here's a map. And I thought it was interesting that Thorne was like, hey, why do I not have that? Why do you have this map? And he's like, don't worry about it. Shut up. (laughs) He's like, I just got the map. Don't worry about it. You know, clearly I got it from your dad or grandfather or whatever it was. I got the impression that Gandalf had loyalty to Bilbo for some reason. Don't know why. And Gandalf was using the dwarves for some reason. 
That's the impression I got. I don't know why any... I I don't think Gandalf cared about the money. I think he, he wanted that dragon dead. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that dragon had turned the East into a waste, and I think Gandalf saw that there was a much bigger problem on the horizon, and having that friction resolved and sorted out, I think he imagined would give all the free people the clarity of mind and sight to maybe come together to deal with a much larger problem that was coming down the pike. I I think that was his agenda. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Thorin was frustrating, man. I wanted him to be heroic and virtuous, but Tolkien stubbornly would not write a pleasant hero. He just wouldn't. This guy's complicated. He's conflicted. He's selfish. He's irritable and surly. He doesn't always make the best decisions. His company of dwarves seems unnecessarily combative to people who could easily become friends if you just talk to them a little bit differently. And underneath it all, you've got the all-seeing narrator indicating them like, hey, like if that's weird for you, sorry, that's just how dwarves are, man. They, I don't know what to tell you. They, they live in holes under the ground and they dig way too deep for things and they, they're talented and they can be okay, but they're not the best. Like that's the tone of the whole book. And then push comes to shove and it's like, yeah, they're okay. Which is kind of weird for a group of 12 people that you hang out with through the entire thing. How attached did you get to the dwarves as you went along? I think the youngest dwarf was the one, was it Boil? Who was it? Bilfer, Bofer? I forget. Who was the youngest dwarf that they always used as a lookout because he had the youngest eyes? I don't. I don't remember. I don't. Their names are all confusing. Um, yeah, and the movie screwed up. So I think of Feely and Keeley who died at the end. And I think one of those two was like, that was the hot dwarf in the movie. Only <laughs> two of the dwarves didn't have like warts and weird noses. Like, oh, okay, well, I wonder which one Kate from Lost is supposed to fall in love with. Like probably the one that looks like a normal person, like a model or something. And not the one that looks like they have a giant rotten cucumber hanging off their <laughs> face from between their eyes. Like, come on. Treat us like we're idiots. Yeah, so th- those were the so only maybe dwarf. it was Hot Dwarf who was the lookout. I don't know. Yeah, that's the one I I became attached to. I tried to draw a mental image of their their hoods because they had different color hoods. Couldn't do it. The second time through, I like tried to like make a mental image of oh this was a blue hood. This was and I just it just didn't stick. Um, one thing that I would like to get your opinion on or your thoughts on what was the purpose of Gollum? Like, what was that all about? That's a great question. Because we just talked about the whole story arc and the fact that, that Bilbo ended up with Gollum and they played the little riddle game that was very difficult for me to follow. The, <laughs> okay. The fact that they got to the other side of that and were like, okay, well, Gollum was just an... I, I guess my question is, in The Hobbit, was Gollum a side character to the same extent as the trolls Bert, Tom and William the trolls that you know turned to stone like is he just a little bitty side quest in this book is that is is that where he's at does it feel to you like pretty much every character is at some level a cautionary tale in this book hmm okay I haven't thought about that maybe not Gandalf Baron is a cautionary tale. I mean, he's two things. He's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, that that's a, a long-standing motif. He's the Hulk. I mean, it's which are you going to get, the man or the beast? And what mood will the beast or the man be in, depending on which one you get after all? I mean, there's that, uh, the, the, this duplicitousness, this Janus effect in a character. That's a cautionary tale. The trolls are a cautionary tale about indulgence and sluggardliness and bickering amongst yourselves while the clock runs out on your own fate. Uh, the people back in the Shire who resist adventure, they're a cautionary tale about cowardice and loving comfort entirely too much. The dark elves who lose their way, they're a cautionary tale about 
giving in to the deceptiveness of your environment. There's something there about their relationship with the environment being skewed compared to the lighter elves of Rivendell, where their relationship with their environment seems to prompt something better. It's like the outside is reflective of the inside somewhere, somehow there. And even though these are similar, one produces something better than the other produces. Obviously, Thorin and the dwarves are all a cautionary tale. And at the goblins with their building only evil things and having only their, their cleverness is all skewed toward evil and craftiness and cunning. So then if that's defensible, what I just said, that there's a cautionary tale implicit in everybody we run into, then maybe Gollum is the most cautionary tale of all the cautionary tales. He happens at about the halfway mark. A lot of times in literature, especially from somebody as well-versed in ancient literature and medieval literature as Tolkien, a lot of times you put the central idea of the whole story, not in act three, like we do with our movies today, but you put it at the inflection point right in the middle of the plot so that everything leads up to that one key central idea, central moment, and then everything leads back down from that in ancient storytelling form. Maybe Gollum is much more the centerpiece of the story than we imagine. What does he represent? He represents, what, selfishness? I think he represents the inward twisting, the sickness of self, more than just liking self, because Gandalf, as you mentioned earlier, he's selfish. I believe I'm entitled to my share of that gold. Like, that's, okay, great. But cool, you probably are. Like he, he's looking out for him. He wants his too. He gets surly and snippy too. But he doesn't live in a cave. He didn't lose like all of his body hair and turn into like some weird mutant bug-eyed monster thing that sits around and obsesses about a piece of jewelry and murders things and eats fish with his bare teeth. Like something about the kind of ingrown selfish relationship with the self of Gollum that's gross and it's like maybe Gollum is the the end game of any of the more cautionary elements in any of the cautionary characters we run into if they're left fully unchecked if life was extended and you could exist longer with those character problems untended and with no good to check those character problems you turn into this cave dwelling hideous monster Maybe that's what he represents. Hmm. I don't know, man. I, I'm just taking Gollum here in this book, in The Hobbit, not, not anything mm-hmm. we learn afterwards. And, and it's confusing. Like, he's a clever being. You know, he's going toe-to-toe with Bilbo. I, and I agree that Bilbo kind of cheated when he said, what's in my pocket? And no Go- kidding. And Gollum's like, well, that's not fair. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Gollum's right. That's not fair. And, uh, but he kind of, he stuck to it like Gollum did. He didn't just flip over the table and say, hey, you cheated. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to eat you now. He kind of stuck to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in that weird moment, Mm -hmm. I felt myself being empathetic towards Gollum and saying, huh, there's something there. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I thought that moment was interesting. You know what I thought was interesting about that exchange that I'd never caught before, and maybe it gets us closer to an answer to your question here, was when Gollum, who clearly had designs for evil, for something violent in mind, when it doesn't go his way and he starts lashing out emotionally, the accusations just fly left and right in any direction. Thief, murderer, coward, like, like whoa. I mean, that's that's kind of a lot. And... Smaug did the same thing. Thief, murderer, all of the the really dangerous bad guys, if they get a, t- a speech, I think even the Goblin King got some of this in. They accuse the heroes of what, as a reader, you feel like the bad guys themselves are. And I, I came away feeling like, man, is this the Roger Stone what to do when you get accused of something, deny, 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 and offer counter accusations. Hmm. Uh, no, I didn't delete the files. You're a file deleter. Is it just that? Or is it meant to cause us to do what you did intuitively and put ourselves in the shoes of Smaug, the unrelatable dragon, because he's a dragon, or 
Gollum, the horrifying cave dweller, because he's a horrifying, slippery skinned cave dweller. Is it meant to maybe put us in their shoes? Are those accusations meant to have some degree of merit? Or is it meant to demonstrate just the madness and insanity and, and flailing toward anything that happens when evil feels threatened? And so it just starts lashing out with accusations regardless of truth. And I'm not sure which. And I guess I'm asking, where do you think those kind of counter accusations were coming from with those characters, Gollum included? I don't know, but I, I thought it was interesting Interesting that they made an appeal to moral authority. How do you mean? When you say you're a thief, that's implying that, well, you shouldn't steal. Therefore, there's some kind of moral code that we all understand. And so I thought about that. I mean, I was like, well, you're not exactly the, you know, the <laughs> you slink around and then you grab goblins and you murder them and eat them. <laughs> that's what you do. And so, yeah. you're, but but those are goblins, right? Like the, those aren't real people. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, it's it's because they look weird and they're from a bad race and they're bad. See, yeah, duh. Look, uh, it's okay if it's yeah. a goblin. You know, it feels kind of weird, doesn't it, it? It does. But when he's screaming, we hates it. We hates it forever. Mm, yeah, thief, thief. We hates it. We hates it forever. The way he talks is so spooky. Yes. Yeah, it's so interesting. I, I like the way Tolkien pluralizes words. Yeah, uh, we are legion. Yeah, yeah, we are legion, absolutely. So it's an implication of demon possession is what you're saying? Well, I, I'm not saying it's an implication of that. I don't think Tolkien is doing allegory here. I just think, I mean, dude is obviously soaked in the history of literature and language and theism from a Western Christian perspective, all that stuff just bleeds through his understanding of power, the danger of power, the notions of self, morality, how to tell a story, language, how language feels even, all of that stuff. It feels like it's, it's coming from the mind of someone who is immersed in a thing, not someone who went Googling for things at the last minute to make a sentence make sense or to try to figure out how to end a chapter. He's drawing on a very, very deep well of things that would seem to inform him overtly, but also very subtly. Uh, he's just writing from who he is, but who he is is saturated in all of that stuff I was just mentioning. So do I think he's saying that Gollum was demon-possessed because he used that we language like the demons in the Bible? Well, the, no, I don't think so. It's just, I bet that stood out to him as one of the freakiest accounts of anything that happened in the Bible. And he remembered how it made him feel. And so he long-term associated that with horrifying evil and then put those words in the mouth of Gollum. Okay, so one, one other thing about Gollum. The one part of the book that bothered me more than anything else, you can have the eagles. Eagles didn't bother me. But the thing that bothered me really, really bad is when Bilbo jumps over Gollum. Hmm. That that bothered me because he talks about what didn't work. Well, he talks about how high he jumps, and it just goes against the whole character that we built up of these little round hobbits with the big feet and with hair on them and stuff. And then he's like, and then he hopped three feet in the air or whatever it was. And I was like, man, Bilbo's got a better vertical than Scotty Pippen. Man, what's up with this, <laughs> <laughs> Scotty Pippen? <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, I read that as being uh, some sort of effect of the ring that he didn't understand at the time and maybe never did understand because he seemed really surprised that he was able to make that jump as well. The, I mean, the ring has subtle powers, like it it makes him live longer, but he doesn't really totally notice why that's happening. And it's even kind of subtle in the way the story's told in The Lord of the Rings in terms of how that ring affects a person in terms of empowering them. I don't know. That's how I read it. I, it didn't trouble me as much. Oh, okay. Stood out, but didn't trouble me. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it's so funny when you read a book like this and it's all fantasy and then you're like, there's no way. <laughs> Can't jump like that. Can't jump I've like that. I've seen pictures of your feet. Yeah, exactly. Like the arch, you don't, you're flat-footed. You don't even have arches. How could you... Generate the necessary for it. Yeah, I, I hear you. It's like we went and watched, uh, I think it was Independence Day. We had a French exchange student <laughs> a long time ago when I was in high school, and his name was Pierre. And we went to yeah. a movie. 
I I want to say it was Independence. No, what was the one where Will Smith goes up and like hacks the the alien spaceship? Oh. Yeah, no, that's that's Independence Day. He punches an alien right in his face, and it's like Welcome to America, or I mean Earth. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum, uh, Brent Spiner helps crack the code, Commander Data. Yeah. He's like an alien expert, and he, they crack the code for how to give him a computer virus. And I just remember thinking, like, oh, it sure is good that the alien spaceship runs on Windows XP, you know, or whatever it was. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 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 whatever it was, huh. however they hack the alien spaceship, I remember thinking, oh, yeah, okay, well, that's convenient that they have the same operating system. And so there's uh, going to be a USB port. <laughs> Plug this data stick right into it and then get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I remember what Pierre said. We watched this whole movie and there's all this stuff. And uh, we walk out and I was like, so, uh, Pierre, what did you think? And he said, um, there is no sound in space. And so the explosions in space, you would not actually hear them. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, that's your takeaway, Pierre. Your takeaway is that <laughs> there was explosion sounds in space, but there wouldn't actually be explosion sounds in space. <laughs> and so I felt a little bit like Pierre, the French guy, uh, when it came to thinking about Bilbo jumping over Gollum. So there you go. Yeah, I can work with that. Yeah. And and things like that are going to be a hang up from time to time. You just got to be honest about that. From time to time, you're going to be cruising along through whatever story you're consuming and for certain people, the world is going to be convincing enough that you're like, oh, well, okay. For other people, the world's going to be convincing in a way that causes something that stands out of your conception of how that world ought to work to feel like it's a betrayal of the context. And stuff like that is pretty harmless. But when it gets really egregious, that's when you get fan backlash and people get mad at a movie or a franchise or whatever. And the the Bilbo leap did not rise to that level for me, but... Hmm. the overuse of the Eagles in the movies it was not backlash worthy, but it was a little much. Hey, this episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by you. And by you, I mean the Wing to SARS, the people who decided to kick in financially on a free podcast because you want to support what we're going for and what we're hoping to accomplish with this conversation Patreon.com is a goodwill engine, and some of you signed up for it to make this thing happen, and we are incredibly grateful. Absolutely. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for supporting at Patreon.com slash questions. We're grateful, just straight up. That's it, uh, and we mean it. Well, this was great, man. Why did you pick The Hobbit? Let me ask that back to you a little different way. How did you feel when you were done with the book? What did this do to you? What did this do for you? I got to go on a quest. I got to escape. I got to I got to be concerned about the things of Middle Earth. Yeah, I, I think that was the value of it for me. I, I got to think about completely different things. What motivates these characters? And uh oh, they're in a tight spot. How are they gonna get out of this? You know, clearly something's gonna happen. It's probably gonna involve Gandalf and Fire, but what's actually gonna go down? I don't know. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was a fun journey, and it was it was really cool to do it with my adult brain. You know, it. Mm. I really like kids' books. I think they're important. Um, you know, you've you've made a a point several times throughout our, our conversational history where you talk about the importance of story, and uh, I think I agree with you. I think that kids' books are super, super important. And uh, I enjoy them. I like what you said about the quest. I think everybody wants that right now. I think we're even willing to go along with quests that maybe don't make the most sense. But if they promise meaning, it resonates with us. And so it's pretty hard to judge somebody for trying to find meaning or chasing off after some cause or something, even if it is a cause du jour a little bit here or there. I think we're built to want to do something that's brave, maybe even a little heroic. I think we're built to want to test our mettle to see if we have what it takes. And also, I think we're all incredibly compromised. And that's what you get in this story. And I suppose that's why I picked it. I agree. I wanted to go on a quest and I was pleasantly reminded of just how compromised the characters are. We're not going on a quest 
where everyone bad is dripping hideous evil. There's some of that. But we're on a quest where some of the evil is along with you on your quest because you brought it with you because it is you. But also you're redemptive if you're on that quest. They, all the characters brought all kinds of good things to the table. And under pressure, they demonstrated both failure and shortcomings, but also generosity of spirit and cleverness and kindness. And I guess I just like the juxtaposition of that quest language, something we're all after, something we all want, meaning, with the reality of good characters, of people having the capacity for great evil, great good, little minor evil, little minor good, the little in-between stuff with the flaws in the characters and the need that they had to show some degree of forgiveness and patience with each other in order to go on the quest. I guess I liked all of those elements. Here's the thing, though. In order for this book to work, there had to be gold at the end of the, the adventure. There had to be that thing that was pulling them along the way, and in this case it was gold or an Arkenstone, whatever you want to imagine it to be. It's, it's mm-hmm. physical treasure, right? Mm-hmm. And then at the end, you know, Bilbo realizes that's not really important, but apparently it's important to all these other people. And so he's able to, you know, use that, as you point out, to try to negotiate peace. But you, you say, we want a quest now. I think that's what was so cool about going to the moon. Hmm. We wanted to go to the moon because it was a new thing. It's an actual thing we can do. We can go to that physical place, and we can do it now. And I think that's what's so cool about space travel at the moment. Mm -hmm. Starlink is important. You know, we're going to be able to communicate with all these satellites. That's great. But ultimately, people going to the moon is cool. That's the goal at the end of the quest, right? Being able to set up a physical presence there. Yeah. Did you track the inspiration launch at all? It's the first commercial. No, I didn't track it. I saw the conversation about it, and I suppose kept track of it through that. But no, not to the degree you did, I'm sure. So the the first commercial flight, space flight, went up. It was just all people that had paid or had their way paid onto this flight with uh, SpaceX. And, and one of the first press releases that came out once they got up there kind of made me sad. It was like, hey, we've uh, we've got this this crew of four people in space. Um, and, and interestingly, this was the headline. I, I, I'll have to go look up the actual headline, but it said, the first sports bet has been placed from space. Yeah, That was the first thing that came up to me. And, uh, or that's the first thing I saw from it. And I was like, really? Is that, what? <laughs> I mean, uh, what? Okay. <laughs> and I, I, there were probably many other things that were happening and all that, but like it's like, well, these four people got to go on this journey, which is really, really cool. Awesome, in fact. But like, what, what's that about? What's the first sports bet has been placed from space? I just don't think that's a worthy um, quest. Like, mm, okay. I agree with you that we need a quest. We need this adventure to go on. But there, what is the gold at the end of the adventure? What is that rallying cry? It's like, oh, well, we're all aligning towards that thing. We're moving towards it. What is it right now? And does it work if there isn't a monster guarding it? Huh. Or do you have to have the monster? The heel? Um, I think more than the heel. The monster. The great kinetic and potential evil that is the final boss guarding the desired outcome, guarding the conclusion of the quest, the thing that must be slain in order to achieve the thing that your party has set its sights on. Does the quest work without the hideous monster? Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. The thing that must be opposed. And if it's necessary, uh uh-huh, if it's necessary, how far will we go because of the way we're wired to make it if it's not obvious and evident already? If what's not obvious and evident already? The great evil. Will we make a great evil in order for there to be a great evil for us to defeat so the quest works? Yeah. What you, if there's no smog? You, you kind of have to have the thing to rally against, don't you? Hmm. 
It's interesting because I think modern warfare is different. Like the name of the game is to never never rise above the level of conflict. You always stay sub-physical conflict. And so it's just this battle of ideals. And if you do it correctly, the other side will never know you're fighting. I don't know. All this is changing. Tolkien was in World War I. Uh, my understanding is he was at the Battle of the Somme. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, I knew that he participated. That's a big one. The Battle of the Somme, man. That's that's huge. A lot of people died there. It's going to affect the way you come home. And we know is well documented by... Uh, there's been some spectacular award-winning history work done. Uh, what's it called? The Great War in Modern Memory? Uh, there's been great work done on how the collective psyche of the young men changed after they came back from the trenches, after they came back to England. Everything was different. The literature changed. All of it changed. One of the central theses, I believe, of that book is that the well at the end of the voyage, I mean, whatever the thing is called, the well at the end of the something, is a story about a knight that goes on a quest and he does the thing and he wins and he defeats evil. And it was very popular amongst the young men who went and fought uh, for the UK. And it was very not popular after that, so much so that it's it's more or less forgotten by you and me, modern audiences. And so I wonder to what degree Tolkien was riffing off of that book that he no doubt was familiar with, that no doubt typified the mindset of he and his other knightly young men who were going to fight a knightly quest for nobility and good and ideals, and then they ended up in trenches with that hideous, awful moment in, in the history of warfare. And then he comes home and he still writes a story about a knightly quest, but it's not headed by a knight who's got a big sword and is all swagger and bravery. It's headed by a gardener with some weird quirks and proclivities and preferences and big clunky feet and who isn't even sure he really wants to go on any quest at all. Like kind of rather stay home, but part of him wants to go. And so he reluctantly goes and he learns good things about himself, learns some things that are flawed about himself, ultimately does something heroic, but he doesn't do that heroic thing by going and slaying the monster. He doesn't slay the monster at all. He uses his burgling skills to try to buy peace. I mean, just what an odd notion of heroism for a young man, James Ronald Rule Token, who was raised on the, the well at the end of whatever that book was called and, and that notion of knights from that era of literature. He still goes and writes a story like that when he's old enough to write stories. But I think World War I and the stuff that he saw gave him the inspiration to tweak that narrative into something that made more sense to him. Hmm. You said when he's old enough to write stories. How old is old enough to write stories? Oh, I just mean quality. I don't think he can produce a story like that when he's 20 years old. Maybe somebody could. But there's enough age and experience and hurt and understanding of human nature present behind the writing of that book that you can tell he wouldn't have been old enough to write it at age 20. To write that book for that guy required more age. Hmm. Are you familiar with Andrew Peterson? I am. He's written the the Wing Feathers saga. I, I feel like he's one of the few people trying to do this in, in modern day life. Yeah. Have you read the Wing Feather, Feather Saga? I have not yet. Uh, no, we're going to, as soon as we're done with this massive Ranger's Apprentice series that we're drawing toward the conclusion of. We started that on sabbatical when I came to see you a few years ago. So we've been really going through that. That's very much like a, a Boy Scouts training manual. It's pretty cool, all the stuff you learn from it. But I think we're going to do the Wing Feather Saga next. And I, I, know, I know a person who I think is on the inside of some designs to to do more with that story, to try to figure out how to tell that story in a, a visual way. I think there's a future to that wing feather material, and I, I think it's going to become more of a household name soon. Oh, that's cool. I met Andrew Peterson once, and I didn't know who he was, and he didn't know who I was, because why should he? And we're sitting there. at We, we went to see a, uh, it was a C.S. Lewis uh, play, by 
the Fellowship of Performing Arts, which is a, a New York-based... Max McLean is the guy that does... He, he plays, in some cases, the role of C.S. Lewis. In other, other cases, he has other people do it. But we both went to this play in Nashville, and somebody knew us both and introduced us. And we had <laughs> we had no idea what to do. Is like, okay, hey, nice to meet you. That's great. Pleasure to meet you. What do you do with that? And uh, <laughs> And had I known who he was, I would have been hugely impressed. He uh, he wrote a, a song that, I, he, he's also a musician, he wrote a song called... A quite an accomplished one. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard Dancing in the Minefields? Yes, I have. Did you send it to me, maybe? It's older. Yeah, I, I think it's, so. It's I, like I, I think I put it on our mixtape a while back. Um, Dan- okay. Dancing in the Minefields is great, and he also wrote one about rocket, like, you know, what it's like to go see a rocket launch. Just an incredible artist. Oh yeah, yeah. How about that? Yeah, it's really interesting. So, I want to learn more about this. My son has—he's uh, devouring the Wing Feather Saga, and uh, I'm about to start myself. And so, I'm interested in it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, re- I really like this conversation, buddy. Thanks for going story with me, like full on old school story. It's fun to hear what that did for your brain and how you came at it. Yeah, thanks for picking The Hobbit. One question, one question here. Why did Tolkien have Bard kill Smaug and not a dwarf, or The Hobbit in this case? Why didn't he have Bilbo kill Smaug? Why was it this this character that we didn't know a lot about at the time? Yeah, I, maybe I w- the idea I wouldn't that... have done that, I don't think. I, I, would, have, I would have given that to... Probably one of the dwarves is probably what I would have done. Maybe one of the lesser dwarves. Well, I like the way it complicated the notion of credit. And they touch on that like right at the end of eh, chapter 12, chapter 13, somewhere in there where Bilbo's like, well, you know, I'm not going to ever get credit for this, but I'm the one who went in there and figured out that information. And it was some bird. I mean, it was a thrush who took that information to Bard and Bard just happened to be the right person for that thrush to take the information to. And I liked the way that by structuring it, the the death of Smaug, the killing of Smaug that way, uh, it it distributed credit for defeating this great evil. And I mean, somebody else gets credit too for taking that scale off in the first place. Who did he do battle with back in the day that caused him to have that weak point in his armor? And so nobody really could get credit for it. No one could get that done on their own. They all had contributions that maybe nobody will ever know, or maybe nobody will ever give you credit for it. But the result wasn't just, oh, like everybody contributed. That's great. Teamwork is very important. That's awesome. But further, I like the way it muddied the water of, all right, cool. So now who gets the treasure at the end? Because if the dragon's still there, if that guy doesn't shoot that arrow, then the dragon's still there if that bird doesn't go and tell him, Does the bird get the treasure? What cut does the bird get? And the bird wouldn't have known what to say if the hobbit hadn't gone and figured that out. Does he get credit? Is the death of the dragon to be chalked up as a mistake on the part of Smaug because he went to make a big point about how awesome he is and because he was braggadocious and ran his mouth in front of Bilbo in a way that is uh, evocative of who was it? Hezekiah in the Old Testament. He was like, yeah, sure. Come on in. Let me show you all my gold and everything and tell you about my stuff. <laughs> well, now it's entirely thwartable. So who gets credit? Was it a mistake on the part of the dragon that did it? Was it teamwork? Was it this individual or that individual? I don't know. And what does that mean for the rewards of the whole thing? I don't know. This is way more complicated than a fairy tale is supposed to be. And everybody's making good points about who should get what. I guess life is a little bit harder than it is in the neat stories that predated Tolkien's time. But when he went to make a story, he made that key element, who kills the monster, really convoluted. And I have never appreciated that as much as I did this time around. So another question, that that's a good answer, distributing the the credit. That's I hadn't considered that. Here's another one. Um, if you had the opportunity to live in Middle-earth, would you do it, and where would you live? Well, I think I'd want to sit on the high throne of Gondor, probably, and have servants and money and have them other people do all the things for me while I just govern, <laughs> I think. Is that an option? Can I pick that, or am I automatically some slave? 
because then I don't want to live there anymore. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> I, the Shire, the Shire just moves my heart, man. I mean, they have green and agriculture and forests and farming and trout. It's magical. I mean, the first time I went there in 2000, whatever it was, when we roll in and ba da 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 you get all the music and everything. I just, wow, it, it just grabbed my heart in ways that very few other places have, not because it was a fairy tale, but because it was something we once had and that maybe still even exists a little bit. And that could still be a thing for all of its you know, quirks and flaws and everything else. The Shire just makes me, it feels like home, like, like it makes me appreciate what I do have that much more, even if it's not perfect, it makes me see the beauty in it more. So that's probably a pretty pedestrian answer, but I just live in the Shire in one of those holes. What about you? I think I would want to live in Rivendell. Um, I also like Bjorn. I thought Bjorn was cool. The way he was just kind of in the woods hanging out. Not the skin changer part. That's not a thing that I think is required in order for me to want to live there. Hmm. I like that he was kind of in harmony with nature around him. He had the bees. Mm -hmm. There was something appealing about that to me. And, and when they chilled out in his house for a while, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I like that too. I would either want to be in Rivendell because I feel like the elves just kind of get it. I feel like they know what's up and uh, they have a higher ideal of everything. Meaning they they think about things larger than themselves is the impression I get. But they're also good at making stuff and um, they're clever. I think that'd be cool. And it just seems very, very peaceful. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe the the good elves are Tolkien's ideal, but the Hobbit are Tolkien's best achievable reality. Yeah. And that's why the characters you follow are Hobbits and not High Elves. Yeah, I think Maybe. so. Yeah, that's good. Dude, this was great, man. Thank you for suggesting The Hobbit. Uh, yeah, thanks for doing it with such enthusiasm, and I, I hope everybody else had fun with it, too. I I had fun with it. My kids went through it, and we've had a ton of conversations about it, too, so hopefully other people have received that collateral benefit also. Yeah, man. It was awesome. Appreciate it, it's dude. It's fun, man. Thanks. You bet. You bet. 